tanto, bueno, muy, muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes para, para todos. Eh, a nombre de la Sociedad Boliviana de Ortopedia y Traumatología, darle la, la bienvenida y un agradecimiento a la Asociación Argentina de Hombro y Codo por colaborarnos con este webinar sobre artroscopía de codo. Un agradecimiento especial para Juan Pablo y la doctora Alessandra que nos van a brindar toda, toda su experiencia. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos. Las preguntas, por favor, las pueden realizar por el chat y una vez terminada la, la exposición, la, las vamos a realizar. Muchísimas gracias y comenzamos, por favor, con Juan Pablo. Bien. Bueno, muchas gracias. Ahí está, me escuchan, ¿no? Muy bien. El, el tema que voy a tratar es iniciando la artroscopía de codo, ¿no? Para aquellos que estén interesados en, en comenzar la artroscopía de codo, es, es un tema muy interesante, cada vez hay más tratamiento indicado, mayores patologías que podemos tratarlas de esta manera, pero hay una gran realidad, y por eso mucha gente no se ahonda todavía en la artroscopía de codo, quizás, es que todas las patologías de codo pueden ser tratadas de forma abierta, ¿verdad? Eso es una realidad a la cual todavía no, no le podemos escapar. Entonces, ¿por qué hacemos artroscopía de codo? Bueno, hacemos artroscopía de codo por este tema, que son todos abordajes e incisiones mínimas. Eso permite menos disección y tratar la misma patología, por ende menos sangrado, tener menos dolor, y además permite hacer una inspección articular. Entonces son varias las ventajas que tiene hacer una artroscopía de codo. Ahora, este es un caso muy sencillo, ¿no? Este era un paciente de 34 años de edad con limitación de la extensión del codo por un osteofito marginal muy evidente. Y estos pacientes con dos portales de 5 milímetros los podemos liberar completamente, nada más sacando el osteofito ya ganan margen de movilidad. Ahí es una de las cosas tan útiles de la artroscopía de codo, ¿verdad? Ahora, ¿por qué no hacemos artroscopía de codo? Bueno, este es el mayor tema, ¿no? Porque hay riesgo de lesión neurovascular. Eso es la verdad. El codo es una articulación compacta, es profunda, y este, salvo su cara posterior, ¿verdad? Y está en zona de tránsito neurovascular. Y uno no está tan acostumbrado a hacer artroscopía de codo como artroscopía de otras partes del cuerpo. Requiere una metodología artroscópica. Ahora, toda esta metodología artroscópica y la forma de hacer la artroscopía de codo ha ido evolucionando alrededor de que sea un procedimiento seguro. ¿No? Porque si el mismo procedimiento lo puedo hacer de forma abierta y por hacerlo de forma artroscópica voy a tener una lesión neurovascular, no vale la pena hacerlo. Entonces el objetivo de esta presentación es repasar los aspectos de seguridad para una artroscopía de codo, algunos conceptos básicos de cómo iniciarla y describir los portales básicos nada más. Después Alessandra les va a comentar mejor cómo ver todo el codo en, en profundidad. Entonces, algunos pasos que pongo para un procedimiento seguro, deben haber muchos más, pero estos para mí son los principales. Lo principal y primero es el conocimiento de la anatomía regional. No podemos dejar de saber en detalle dónde están las estructuras neurovasculares más importantes del codo, sobre todo su relación con las estructuras óseas, que es lo que nos va a servir a nosotros de referencia externa para ingresar al codo y trabajarlo. La posición del paciente es muy importante. Puede ser de forma supina, con el brazo colgando, en forma prona o en decúbito lateral. A mí me han enseñado a hacerlo en decúbito lateral y yo tuve la suerte de aprender de hacerlo de gente que hace muchas artroscopías de, de codo por año. Me parece muy seguro, no solo para nosotros, sino para el anestesista que puede tener acceso fácil a la vía aérea. Y nosotros lo colocamos en un soporte, lo ponemos en decúbito lateral con un soporte del brazo entonces el codo tiene poco movimiento lateral lateral, pero nos permite hacer flexión y extensión del codo. Es una forma muy segura. Entonces cuando yo trabajo la artroscopía de codo, trabajo de frente, nadie me molesta y fíjense que la disposición parece mucho a la artroscopía de una rodilla, ¿verdad? Otro elemento de importancia y seguridad cuando trabajamos en el cúbito prono o, el prono o lateral, como es este caso, es esto, tener un vendaje elástico alrededor del antebrazo para no permitir que discurra líquido articular o líquido con el cual estamos trabajando hacia el antebrazo y genere un eh, síndrome compartimental. El insuflado articular, otro paso para un procedimiento seguro, para mí es muy importante, hay gente que no lo hace, pero la verdad es que está demostrado que cuando insuflamos la articulación antes de la cirugía, colocamos solución fisiológica, los nervios se van a alejar del hueso. 
y eso me da un rango de seguridad. Y lo otro interesante es que además genera resistencia para poder penetrar la cápsula con mayor facilidad, especialmente con el trocar inicial que colocamos. Aquí un videito de cómo estamos colocando el, el insuflado. Estamos usando el portal medio lateral entre el olecrano, el epicondio y la cúpula radial. Fíjense que siempre pintamos las estructuras óseas sobre el codo antes de empezar la cirugía. Después el codo se puede distender y perdemos las referencias anatómicas. Entonces las estructuras óseas las pintamos, las dejamos marcadas, insuflamos la articulación. Después les voy a mostrar del lado medial cómo pintamos también el nervio cubital, que es muy importante. Bueno, y los portales, les voy a describir de forma general cómo eh, ubicamos los portales, cómo los hacemos. Y los portales nos sirven para dos cosas, para colocar la cámara y tener visión articular, que es de fundamental importancia, y para colocar instrumentos de trabajo, y a su vez los vamos a ir intercambiando. Los portales pueden ser anteriores o posteriores, los anteriores pueden ser mediales o laterales, y el posterior, posterior o postero laterales, nunca postero mediales porque está el nervio cubital en estrecha relación con el canal epitrópico craneal. O sea, los portales van a estar determinados por las estructuras neurovasculares, por eso tenemos que saber dónde están para poder poner nuestros portales en zonas de seguridad, que son estas. Y todos los portales, en mayor o menor medida, pueden ser más proximales o más distales, dependiendo de nuevo de las estructuras anatómicas. El portal anteromedial, mucha gente empieza con el portal anteromedial, a mí también me gusta empezar mis atroscopías con el portal anteromedial. Usamos la epitroclea como referencia, las estructuras de mayor riesgo acá van a ser el nervio cubital, que pasa por detrás de la epitroclea, siempre tenemos que revisar que no sea un nervio luxable, Así sabemos exactamente dónde está. Y por delante y más alejado va a estar el nervio medial. Entonces podemos hacer un portal anteromedial directamente anterior a la epitroclea o anteromedial proximal, de nuevo intentando de evitar lesionar el nervio mediano cubital y de forma punteada, que tenemos que separarlo cuando hacemos el portal en piel, ramas del nervio antebraquio cutáneo interno. Entonces tomamos como referencia la punta de la epitroclea, vamos hacia proximal, hacia anterior, puede variar entre 1 y 2 centímetros, y vamos a tener acceso a mirar todo el aspecto anterolateral del codo, cúpula radial, coronoides y parte distal del húmero. Entonces palpamos, sabemos dónde está el nervio cubital que está marcado, epitróclea, 1 o 2 centímetros por delante, aproximal, hacemos la incisión superficial en piel, y después hacemos una disección roma para evitar lesionar cualquier estructura cutánea. Tomamos el trocar, la articulación está insuflada y apuntamos hacia la cúpula radial. Entramos, una vez que entramos sale el líquido que habíamos metido adentro y empezamos con nuestra visión. Ahora vean que el codo está firme, está rígido, nadie nos molesta. Insuflamos la articulación, podemos ver bien cerquita nuestro, haciendo flexión extensión, la punta de la apófisis coronoides hacia el lateral con pronosupinación en la cúpula radial y todo el extremo anterolateral del húmero distal, cápsula e inserción tendinosa lateral. Bien, el portal anterolateral del otro lado, la estructura con mayor riesgo aquí va a ser el nervio radial que después se transforma en nervio interóseo posterior. Usamos el epicóndilo como la estructura de referencia y podemos poner un portal anterolateral directo o uno más proximal. La tendencia es que a más proximal tenemos mayor seguridad de no lesionar el nervio. A nosotros a mí me gusta hacerlo de adentro hacia afuera, es decir, una vez que estoy mirando desde el anteromedial, desde afuera colocar el anterolateral, y ahí les voy a mostrar. Estamos mirando de nuevo, como veíamos antes, el sector lateral del codo. Palpo con mi dedo, cuando palpo se abomba la cápsula, y coloco de afuera hacia adentro una aguja. Ahí está la aguja intraarticular, fíjense que la aguja está justo por delante y por encima del epicóndilo lateral. Y después generamos el portal lateral. De nuevo la incisión en piel es bien superficial y después trabajamos de forma roma profunda. 
En este caso estamos metiendo una punta a una Halstead, si no podemos meter directamente con el, el bisturí con más experiencia, o directamente también el, el shaver. ¿no? En este caso abrimos un poquito el agujero que hicimos con la punta de la Halstead, colocamos un shaver y empezamos a hacer el trabajo que queremos hacer. En este caso estamos sacando osteofitos de la punta de la apófisis coronoides y de húmero distal. Y una vez que terminamos con el trabajo, el compartimiento anterolateral, y si queremos cambiar de portales, también hay formas de hacerlo de forma segura. Ahora les, les voy a mostrar. Aquí estamos sacando el osteofito del húmero distal. Pero fíjense que siempre está la cápsula distendida y estamos trabajando sobre hueso. Nunca tocando la cápsula en este momento. Y siempre que trabajamos con el shaver en el compartimiento anterior, lo hacemos sin, en, sin este, succión, ¿sí? sin aspiración. Así no tenemos daño capsular. Una vez que terminamos de hacer el trabajo anterior, vamos a cambiar los portales y en vez de sacar los portales y empezar de nuevo, apunto el shaver hacia la cánula donde tenemos la, la cámara y voy retrocediendo con la cámara y adelanto el shaver adentro de la cánula. Entonces no necesito sacar los portales para perderlos, para intercambiarlos, digamos. ¿no? Avanzo con el shaver, con el trocar uso una cánula de intercambio o un Steinman Romo y cambio de lugar de los portales. Ahora voy a pasar a mirar desde el portal lateral hacia el portal medial. Y esa es una forma segura de cambiar los portales y seguir trabajando en el compartimiento sin perder referencia de las estructuras óseas, especialmente cuando el codo se empieza a inflar un poquito. El compartimiento posterior, por suerte, es más sencillo en cuanto a seguridad, porque el único nervio que tenemos que tener en cuenta aquí es el nervio cubital. Mientras estemos alejados del piso del canal epitróclero craneal o la zona medial del tríceps en sí, estamos seguros y podemos ir trabajando en toda esta franja, desde el portal posterior directo, uno más proximal, uno posterior lateral o el medio lateral, estamos seguros. Inclusive aquí el uso del bisturí puede ser directo a través del tríceps, hacia la fosa olecraniana o hacia el hueso. ¿Sí? Ahí hicimos el portal directo posterior, ahora estamos haciendo uno postero lateral por el lado lateral del tríceps, pero vean que siempre trabajo lejos del nervio cubital. Lo dejo aquí marcado, ya sé dónde está. Y accedemos al compartimiento posterior, y enseguida podemos ver la punta de la apófisis este, perdón, del olecranio. La fosa coronoide, en este caso era un caso con una osteocondromatosis este, sinovial múltiple, ahí le estamos sacando los, los fragmentitos. En el compartimiento posterior podemos trabajar con mayor seguridad con aspiración con el shaver, salvo cuando estemos trabajando en el rincón medial. Este es el rincón medial, por detrás de esta cápsula va a estar el, el nervio cubital. Esta es la zona que hay que tener cuidado en la zona posterior. Pero después podemos trabajar con comodidad mientras estemos cerca del hueso. Ahí sacamos todos los cuerpos libres. El uso de retractores es otro paso importantísimo en procedimiento seguro. Así como cuando hacemos cirugía abierta usamos retractores para separar y para tener mejor visión y trabajar más cómodos, tenemos que saber usar retractores en la artroscopía de codo. Nos sirve para separar partes blandas y cápsula, pero además para trabajar con baja presión de líquido. Si estamos trabajando, si la artroscopía de codo la hacemos con manguito hemostático, entonces no hay problema no va a sangrar el codo. Podemos trabajar con presiones de líquido bajas, así no generamos edema y que el procedimiento sea más complicado. ¿verdad? Aquí estamos haciendo resección de osteofitos en un paciente artropático y fíjense que quiero sacar el osteofito acá, en, que está justo por encima de la fosa del húmero distal y la cápsula articular se me viene encima, no me permite trabajar cómodo. Entonces en estos casos colocamos un portal lateral más proximal cerca del hueso, y utilizamos cualquier elemento romo para separar la cápsula. Ahí entramos con el elemento, separo la cápsula articular, sin necesidad de aumentar la presión del líquido articular en el codo, y podemos resecar osteofitos con mayor seguridad y mayor tranquilidad. La planificación preoperatoria, quizás este punto tiene que estar antes de todo, ¿no? pero es, es muy importante tener un mapa del codo, una tomografía computarizada, si es con reconstrucción tridimensional mejor, saber de antemano qué portales queremos usar y cómo llegar a cada uno de estos rincones que queremos llegar 
que les va a mostrar Alessandra mejor. Este, uno de, de mis maestros que me ha, ha enseñado muchísimo la artroscopía de codo, John O'Driscoll, él decía que antes pasaba aproximadamente entre media hora y una hora de la cirugía mirando el, la tomografía, teniendo ese mapa, ese registro en su cabeza antes de empezar a operar, para evitar cualquier complicación. Entonces la suma de todos estos elementos hacen que sea una, un método sencillo y seguro para el paciente, pero todo esto lo más importante es conocer mis límites. Entonces, empezar con casos más sencillos a más complicados, a medida que me siento más cómodo con la anatomía del codo, que siento que puedo trabajar en un espacio libre y cómodo voy avanzando. Mi recomendación es empezar con resecciones de cuerpos libres, después con resecciones de estopitos, de anatomía en, en casos de epicondilalgia lateral, y así progresivamente ir avanzando, pero a medida que uno se sienta cómodo trabajando con seguridad en el codo. Bueno, espero que les haya sido útil esta presentación. Eh, y los invito a todos a visitar este, ortofliximal.com, que tenemos procedimientos quirúrgicos paso a paso para que puedan disfrutar. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias. Juan Pablo, excelente presentación. Tenemos unas cuantas, unas cuantas consultas, por favor. Eh, sí. Aldo nos pregunta eh, si lo hace con bomba de presión y si es así, ¿a cuánto? Sí. Yo lo, lo hago con bomba de presión porque estoy acostumbrada a hacerla, pero la, le pongo el flujo en 80, pero la presión, los milímetros de mercurio, entre 20 y 25. Muy, muy bajo. Lo único que dejo es que salga un chorrito de, de líquido para que distienda un poco la cápsula. Y a partir de eso no me muevo, uso retractores. Perfecto, muchísimas gracias. Patricio Moggio de Argentina, eh, ¿qué diámetro de óptica utiliza? La de 4 milímetros, la misma que rodilla y, y hombro, ¿sí? Eso es una pregunta que nos hacen con frecuencia, hay que recordar que esto es un procedimiento que es intracapsular, pero es extraarticular. Salvo que sea un codo inestable, no, nunca vamos a entrar entre los huesos, sino que vamos a trabajar por delante o detrás de ellos. Con 4 milímetros estamos muy bien. Tenemos una pregunta de Víctor Naula. Dice, Luigi Padersini, antes de iniciar la artroscopía de codo, realizaba transposición del nervio ulnar. Eh, mm. Si se sigue utilizando o ya no. No, no, no se hace de, de rutina. Sí se hacen para los casos de, de rigideces de codo que hayan estado mucho tiempo con menos de 100 a 90 grados de flexión. Mínimamente hay que descomprimir ese nervio o transponerlo si es necesario. Pero si uno lo transpone, tiene que saber exactamente dónde está si quiere hacer una artroscopía de codo después. Cuando hay un nervio transpuesto previo a la artroscopía de codo, o no se hace la artroscopía y se hace directamente la cirugía abierta, o hay que ubicarlo con ecografía, o hay que disecar, hay que saber dónde está. Perfecto. Después Luis Pedro Carranza le consulta el uso de retractores mediales. Sí, se pueden usar mediales también, ¿sí? teniendo los mismos parámetros de seguridad. Recuerden que del lado medial, tenemos portales anteromediales clásicos, anteromediales proximales también. Se pueden usar, pero por lo general yo uso el lateral porque me resulta más cómodo y con uno habitualmente es suficiente. Tenemos otra consulta de don Ever Maquera. Si tuvo alguna complicación neurológica durante la realización de la artroscopía y cuáles fueron las más frecuentes y cómo la solucionó. Mira, por ahora, por suerte, no tuve ninguna complicación neurológica. Sí tuve dos casos míos de rigideces importantes, que cuando empecé la artroscopía el espacio para mí era muy cerrado y decidí pasar a cirugía abierta previo a tener el riesgo de hacer una lesión neurológica. Con eso me cuido mucho. Por suerte no he tenido mi caso. El tiempo quirúrgico más o menos estimado y el uso de torniquete. Sí, nunca, el tiempo quirúrgico nunca va a ser más de una hora y media justamente por el tiempo de, de torniquete. A mí no, no me ha tocado tardar más que eso. Perfecto. Pero, bueno, eso es, por eso es muy importante la planificación preoperatoria, porque el paso tiene que ir muy fluido, porque uno sabe que tiene el tiempo límite del torniquete. Perfecto, Juan Pablo, muchísimas gracias, excelente presentación. Ya no, no tenemos bien, más consulta. Eh, por favor, pasamos con Eduardo y Juan Martín para que sigamos con la doctora Alessandra. Hola a todo el mundo, eh, yo hablaré en, en inglés, I'm, I'm sorry, 
but uh, I'm uh, trying to learn Spanish, but I'm not so good now. Um, I, I saw uh, from the talk of Dr. Simone, can you see the presentation? Can you hear me? Can you see the presentation? Se ve, doctora, perfecto. Adelante, se está viendo, okay. se está viendo muy okay. bien. Okay. Okay, so um, I, I see from the presentation of Dr. Simone that we, we think that same things, so we have the same uh, kind of approach to the Advo atroscopy, fortunately for you. Uh, so Dr. Burman in the 1931 stated that the elbow was unsuitable uh, to the atroscopic exploration, but after that, uh, Odrisco more recently uh, explained us if we know the anatomy, if we know where the nerves are, we know that the, where the nerves are not, so we are able to explore atroscopically the joint of the elbow. We already seen the, the portal with Dr. Simone, so we know we, when we uh, work in the elbow, we know that we are watching like from a window, so our portal is the window and you can see the opposite structure, structure the respect to the portal. Uh, and of course, we can see just the intraticular portion of the elbow. Uh, so the capsule, the cartilage, and the bone, and we can see very well the ligaments, and then we, we see this after in the next presentation. Um, about the medial portals, we have the choice to make two kinds of portals. We can stay more proximal if we need to work in this area. In most of the case, we approach the generative problems or osteoarthritis uh, or stiffness. So we have to use this portal to release the capsule. We have to remove the osteophytes, bony spurs. But when we have to deal with a fracture or the coronoid, uh, I prefer to make a more distal portal, uh, more or less at the level of the rim of the joint. In this way, we are able to manage in a better way the fragment using a retractor or other instrument. Uh, if you make this portal, you have the bump of the trochlea, so it's very difficult to manage the fragment. And we already see the, the posterior portal. Uh, I would like to stress that it's very important to go here in the medial gutter to check uh, for a uh, look for loose bodies, potentially loose bodies. We know that uh, behind the capsule, we have the ulnar nerve. And, uh, this is the central area of the posterior side, and uh, we normally use the posterior lateral portal to see the olecranon fossa. But in some instances, if you have a, a bony spur around the olecranon, and you are not uh, familiar with the shape of the olecranon, you can put the scope here, then you can see the symmetry of the olecranon. It, it, it's easier for you to understand uh, the, the shape of the olecranon that's removed. And this is a very important point for me uh, to reach this area. So you have to slide along the lateral ridge of the olecranon, then you have to turn the scope anteriorly, and you can reach this area. This area is, um, I suggest you to try to make this kind of movement every time you have to treat an elbow atroscopically because it is a tough area. Most of the cases are full of soft tissue, the synovitis, sometimes you can find osteophyte. If you are able to reach this point easily because you are used to do it every time, it's easier for you. Uh, on the other hand, if you do it once in a while, it could be difficult. And in this area, you see the proximal radial ulnar joint, the radial head, the capitellum from the back. And if you turn the scope medially, is the only way to see inside the ulnohumeral joint. So you extend the elbow a little, you supinate, and you open the ulnohumeral joint. If the elbow is unstable, you can even make the so-called drive-through test, so you can push the scope inside the joint. So if you stand a little, you stress, you can go inside the ulnohumeral joint. This is the only way to reach a potential damage of the trochlea, like an OCD of the trochlea. You can see the bare area of the olecranon. And if you are able to pass through the joint, it means that the elbow is unstable. So it's a, it has also a diagnostic value. 
So uh, the, the steps that Dr. Driscoll told me uh, about the, uh, the beginning of the artroscopy is first get in, establish a view, a create space in which to work. So Garin established a rule. So in some instances, it's very easy. Uh, some other times, it's very difficult. So uh, we know already from Dr. Simone that we start generally with the injection of uh, 20 cc of, uh, of a saline liquid. We, I use generally the posterior portal, but it doesn't matter. You can use both the soft spot portal or the posterior portal. And once again, uh, we start, as Dr. Simone told us, uh, from the anteromedial um, portal. It's very important just cut the skin to avoid the damage of the uh, cutaneous branches of the nerve. But the most important thing for me here to teach you to stay uh, far from the bone. I mean, uh, when the entrance point of the portal, you don't have to be too close to the bone. In, in this way, you are not able to put in the right position the instrument. The instrument must point uh, against the bone from the anterior to posterior. Uh, and the direction of the instrument is very important because if you put the instrument on, in this direction, you can damage the, the nerves. Uh, on the other hand, if you enter in this way, and you have this direction, you are safer. And I agree with Dr. Simone, we use the retractor instead to put very high pressure on the pump. We use around 30 millimeters of uh, uh, of pressure of the of the pump to avoid the, the um, uh, compartmental syndrome, and uh, after making the first portal, so we we said the anteromedial portal. We go on making the second one is the anterolateral portal. We use a, a, a needle as we saw previously, but in very difficult cases, you can use the the an opposite technique, the inside out technique. So you use the switch, st uh, switch stick, you can cut the skin and then pull the switch and stick and use it as a guide for the shaver. In some cases where we have to deal with a very stiff elbow, uh, we can have some trouble to, to find a way to see the joint. So my suggestion is try to stay inside the joint and feel and feel absolutely you have to feel the bone. This is very important. Not start cutting something if you're not very careful, you're not sure that touching the bone. Um, in some instances, you can see, you are not, not able to see the corner, the, your anatomical landmark, you just see, uh, see um, white tissue. So in those cases, I go out, I restart, I use the retractor, uh, before making the portals, for example, and I, I use the scope uh, like a periostal elevator to try to find a way to touch the bone. And uh, after that, you have to start to releasing, you have to start to create a space in which to work. So first uh, you can remove the sign of Addis, and we generally start from the entrance point on the portal. So we release the soft tissue on the supinatory crest or we are doing now. This is uh, most of the case of the procedure that we do when we have to treat a lateral apicondylitis. So we open the capsule, we release the supracondylar crest. In this way, you detach the anterior capsule from the humerus. So you open the space. And, uh, and using retractor, you can see that very gradually you can have a bigger space in which to work. This is fundamental because in this way you can increase the distance be between your instruments, your cutting instruments and the capsule and so the nerve. Uh, it's very important to know uh, the internal mar markers, a landmark for the nerve. The radial nerve is uh, exactly in front of your radial head. So from behind, from inside the joint, you know that the radial nerve is in the middle of the radial head behind the capsule. And uh, another step very important, you try to remove all the loose bodies. Uh, most of the surgeons tell us that the, the loose, body, loose body removal is an easy procedure. Uh, I don't think it's so easy like uh, people think. Um, I think that sometimes you need to uh, grab the, your, 
your loose bodies and uh, the, the loose bodies flop around your joints. So you have to fix it with a needle. This is uh, useful as tips in the posterior side. In the anterior side, sometimes if you use a big grasper, you open the grasper, the, the fluid the, the, um, push the loose body in the grasp. So it's another nice trick to use. It's very important to make the capsulectomy after the bony work. This is because uh, when you make the bony work, you have a lot of debris. And uh, if you have already done the capsulectomy, you can, you can increase in this way the pressure of the forearm and increase the risk of compartmental syndrome. So after getting uh, established a view, uh, remove the loose bodies, you have to do your bony work. And another question that most of the people uh, do is how can I uh, understand how much bone I have to remove? Well, uh, one suggestion could be that you, you go on removing the bone un until you can see once again the soft tissue. The soft tissue in the olecranon fossa is the original periosteum of the native uh, coronoid fossa. So in this way, you can understand when you finish to remove the, all the extra bone. And after that, as a final steps, you can do the uh, capsulectomy. So we can discuss about the capsulectomy uh, in the, uh, when you have a lot, mm, a loss of extension, just a 20, 30 degree, I generally do just the stripping of the capsule from the bone. When you have a, a bigger contractor in extension contractor, you have to do the capsulectomy. Now we are making the capsulotomy. It means we are just cutting, making a transfer cut in the capsule. And this technique is called bite and peel. It means that you grasp the tissue and peel the, pull the tissue from the brachial muscle. After that, you can go on resecting all the capsule. This is the most risky procedure uh, in abdo arthroscopy. So you don't have to use the suction in the step. You have to be very careful. You don't have to cut the muscle. Of course, you are safer on the medial side because you have the brachialis that protect the, your medial nerve. But on the lateral side, you have a risk to damage the radial nerve. So you have to be very careful. You have to detach just the capsule from the muscle, not to cut inside the fibers of the muscle. This is a very important point. Going back to this area, I, I told you this is the most difficult one because it's very tight and then sometimes you have scar tissue and sometimes it's very difficult to reach the radio head from the back. So one trick could be use the switch and stick and push it until you feel the bone and you feel the radio head and then you put the scope under uh, lying on your switch and stick. And generally, if you put the uh, working instrument like the shaver in this area from the soft spot portal, you start to remove all the synovial tissue. You work in this way. And uh, the aim is re to reach the uh, radial head. After reaching the radial head, it means that you remove all the tissue. In this way, you can see very well the radio ulnar proximal joint. You to check the posterior insertion of the radial head, uh, the annular ligament, sorry. Um, you can also release, if you have a contractor in pronal supination, uh, the tissue in the back of this joint. But I like uh, a lot to making these cross portals. Uh, if you, you can see from the proximal anteromedial portal and use your instrument from the back. So you see anteriorly and you work from the back to the front. In this way, you have the advantage to be parallel to the radio head. And this uh, procedure, this step is useful. Um, of course, if you have a synostosis or you have a deformity of the radio head, so you can be parallel to the joint. You can slide here in this area. So it's very useful and is the only way to release completely the radial head. Because if you enter from the anterolateral portal from this direction, you are not able to go here. If you watch anteriorly and work from the back to the front, you are able to, to work in this area. And now we went back on the, on the posterior lateral portal and the soft, um, soft spot portal to release the posterior side. Same tips as uh, if you want to make a, a resection of the radio head 
for the same reason. You are parallel to the radial head and the, to the joint, so you can make a very nice resection, very symmetric, working from the back and watching from the front. For the OCD, uh, same concept, we work in this area. Most of the cases, the OCD is posterior on the capitellum, but you can use two portals parallel and very, very close one to each other. Uh, you can use the same portal, you can make two portals. In this way, you are able to see the capitellum from, uh, from distal to proximal. It can use, you, you can make a debris or uh, microfractal, whatever you want, but you can see very well in this way. Uh, the last option, there was a case of HO around the radial head. It's very important in this case of, of HO to try to understand the relation between the HO and the nerves, particularly in this case of the radial nerve. As you can see, the patient has a pre-op good flexion extension. It has a loss of supination. So after watching carefully the uh, CT scan, we decide to remove the ossification with a, with a true arthroscopy. And um, same concept, in this case, we have a high risk of injury of the radial nerve. So we have to detach the soft tissue from the bone. So we're watching from proximal and intermediate working laterally. And we have to use the suction just for a few seconds when you have to suck the debris because you are now able to see. And the radial nerve is here we release the, the capsule. So you must be very careful not to wrap the tissue on the side of the capsule, obviously. And after that, you we can check. We decide to keep the implant inside because it was fine and we didn't have any kind of chondropathy. So the conclusion, the same concept of the Dr. Simone, is uh, not uh, try to be very careful when you approach arthroscopic and an elbow and ask to somebody else with a major expertise to help you if you are, are in doubt. Don't go behind your limits. Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias, Alexander. Eh, excelente la presentación. Eh, un gusto de volver a, a verte y a tenerte en nuestra asociación. Y bueno, vamos a abrir el, el cuestionario de preguntas para los participantes. Eh, Juan Martín. Si bueno, gracias. Muy buena la presentación. Hay una pregunta, hay una, hay una pregunta eh, sobre si, si eh, en un caso de una triada desafortunada o terrible de codo, eh, podés, eh, qué indica, si tenés indicación de, de artroscopía o de tratar de resolverla de esa forma. Uh, in the next talk, I will going to speak exactly of this, of the fracture, uh, arthroscopic approach to the fracture. So, is, uh, we, we're going to talk. Okay. Um, I, I can tell you now that I like to um, approach arthroscopically the terrible child, but just the easier case not the okay. big type of trial. So small fracture type two of the radial head, small fracture type one of the coronoid, no major instability because it's, it becomes very complex. So just the okay. minor cases. Y en estos casos de, de que mostraste de, de rigidez, ¿cuál es tu principal indicación o, o cómo llegan, qué, qué tipo de rigidez es post-traumáticas, osteoartritis eh, primaria? Uh, we, uh, I, I can tell you, I, I push a lot uh, the arthroscopy because I, I really like it. I think you are uh, very uh, precise with the arthroscopy, sometimes more than open because you can approach three-dimensionally the elbow, medial, lateral, posterior. And um, with the open assess, we generally you choose on one incision, lateral or medial side. So you are very, very three-dimensional. Uh, said that, um, I don't have many contraindications, except the anterior uh, submuscular transposition of the ulnar nerve. I did some uh, arthroscopy in uh, stiffness, uh, even after uh, subcutaneous transpos transposition, because I look for the nerve, I see the nerve, I retract the nerve, so you can put the scope. And um, 
I think we have to separate the, the stiffness of the elbow in two big groups, the degenerative and the post-traumatic. The degenerative cases are easier. You, you have um, uh, um, a lot of space inside the joint, it's not very difficult. On the other end, the post-traumatic could be very difficult. So uh, probably uh, it's a different way in your, if you have a beginner in this kind of surgery, you have to have in your mind this concept. So the, it's better to begin with the degenerative problem instead of that post-traumatic. Post-traumatic, even if you have a, a small point, you can have a lot of tissue inside the joint. It could be very, very difficult to get in and establish a beauty. Dr. Simone, do you agree? Do you agree? Se escucha una interferencia. Sí, ya, ya se liberó. Bueno. Hay una pregunta. Uh, in which cases do you indicate uh, radial head resection? So, not in traumatic patient, never. Uh, but in some cases of degenerative problem, if you visit the patient, examine the patient before the surgery, and the patient complain of the radial humeral uh, pain, and, uh, we generally do um, like a um, compression test. We ask to the patient to push in supination and pronation against, against resistance. If the patient complain about the lateral pain, it means that probably the pain of the joint are related to the, the, the bruise of the radial head. Of course, in most of the cases that, uh, that they complain about pain, they also have a CT scan that show you uh, gels and uh, arthritic joint. In, uh, but are very selective cases. I remember a few, uh, I, I done a few cases of the resection of the radial head. So just in, in a very sharp pain on the lateral side in osteoarthritic elbow that uh, you have to approach with a release and uh, osteopath removal because uh, in this way you increase the instability. So uh, very, very often you see the arthritic joint on the lateral side, but the patient is asymptomatic. So be very careful not to cut the radial head if the patient is asymptomatic on the lateral side because you, you risk uh, instability. It's a question from of André Lech to both speakers. Are you releasing the cubital tunnel by arthroscopy? Uh, you mean the release of the nerve? Yes. Uh, I don't do it because I think it's, uh, it's risky. Uh, sometimes you waste a lot of time. So um, if I had just to do the, the ulnar nerve neurolysis, I do by open with a small incision. If we have to uh, do the neurolysis in association to the arthrolysis, I do first the nerve, isolate the nerve. I don't transpose retinally the nerve, I just make uh, the, the neurolysis. And then I do all the surgery. And after, at the end of the arthroscopy, I use that small incision to resect the posterior medial capsule and to check if there's something uh, like a small burst and osteophyte uh, on the medial side of the joint. But I, I don't like to do arthroscopically. I don't know if Dr. Simone agree with me, but. Eh, Juan comenta que está teniendo un problema con su micrófono. Justo no sé, Rodrigo, ah. si. Juan Pablo Simone. Ahí estoy. Ahí voy, ahí voy. Ahí está. Eh, eh, lo mismo, ¿no? no hago la descompresión artroscópica del nervio, también si la tengo que hacer es un abordaje mínimo y también sirve de paso para las contracturas en flexión para liberar el fascículo posterior del ligamento medial y se hace en el mismo acto, pero no hago trabajo en esa zona con la artroscopía. No, no I agree with you. Y, y Alessandra, en esos casos de eh, Juan comentó de, de una rigidez importante, previo eh, a la cirugía justamente con el nervio, con el cubital, ¿en qué casos hace un release previo o no? Uh, so, in the past, the uh, indication were uh, if you have a contractor no more than 90 degrees, or if you want to recover more than 40 degrees, or if you have a, a previous neuropathy. 
but now the indications are wider. Uh, I mean, the indication includes also a loss of just 30 degrees of tension. I, I talked about this topic with Dr. Druisko. He, he started to make the neurolysis, ulnar neur neurolysis, even in case just of the 30, 40 degrees of contracture in extension with full flexion. Because it seems that the, the floor of the, the area of the area can have many adherences on, with the nerve. So it's better to release the nerve. In my experience, I do it in any contractor. Okay. I, I don't do it, of course, in the trauma. Uh, in the trauma, I do it just if I have to uh, repair the medial side, uh, I mean, the, the medial ligament. Bueno. Ok. Muchas gracias. Bueno, continuamos. No sé, Rodrigo, ¿te parece con la otra okay. presentación? Ok. Ok, ok. Well, let's go to, okay, let's talk about fracture. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, thanks. So uh, we, we, I'll answer to the, uh, to the question about the terrible trial. So we know that arthroscopy is- uh, Sorry, the, sorry, Alexander. Now we are seeing a, a list of presentation, not, not the, the PowerPoint. Uh, well, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. I can't find the zoom now. Uh, zoom, 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 not zoom. Oh, wait a moment, sorry. Yes, yes. Okay. Allora, così siamo. Così. Okay, I think I'm done. Perfect. It's okay. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. No, uh, no so, uh, we know that elbow arthroscopy is safe um, uh, even in fracture, but we know we have to stress once again the pressure must be low, and we always have to try to understand the pattern of instability. Uh, about the radio head, I suggest, and the, and the literature support me, that uh, we can treat atroscopically the type 2 fracture of meson and uh, ligament and, uh, um, uh, and a periosteum continuity. This is why if we have um, a lesion of the lateral side, I routinely do it uh, by open approach because you have to repair the ligament, you just have to um, cut the skin, you can approach very easily the, the joint. So the arthroscopy for me mustn't be just a virtual uh, technicism, but can give you, must give you some advantage. And uh, this is a case of uh, type 2 with uh, also an involvement of the neck, uh, but this, the fracture of the neck was very stable. So we uh, start generally um, in the lateral side position, with a proximal anteromedial portal. So the advantage is, of course, we can uh, uh, remove of the fragment of the cartilage. Another very important point, and if, when you go inside the joint, you have to check the relation between the capitellum and the radial head. If you see the contact is good, like in this case, it means that the ligament, the lateral side of the ligament is fine. You, you see in another case when the, this distance is very increased, it means that uh, you have a lesion of the lateral complex. And as you can see here, there's no damage of the annular ligament. Sometimes we use the annular ligament uh, uh, as a, a way to keep a reduction of the fragment. So 
um, I used in, the, in my experience many in different instruments, the retractor, and I like to use the chondropic because it's pointed, so you can, can go inside the fractor, you can turn it and you can push it back in its position. So uh, we put two screws just to fix the, the fragment. And then we, as you can see, the, the advantage of the arthroscopy is that you don't have to cut the annular ligament. You can leave it intact. And uh, we can put the screw in different position from the back to the front or from la lateral, you know, from a lateral position. We use normally the cannulated screw in titanium 2.4 or 3.0. And uh, uh, we can uh, put it in different shapes, but uh, in my experience, I prefer to put it from the back to the front. We can see um, uh, in the other uh, slide that we can put the screw in other position. And you have to check arthroscopically when you put the screw, the compression of the fracture. And after the fixation, you check the stability of the fragment and you check once again the contact between the uh, radio head and the capitalum to be sure that the instability is, uh, doesn't exist. But we generally um, uh, do the test uh, under amplioscope uh, before starting with the surgery because uh, as I told you the indication to open or arthroscopic approach is related to the condition of the status and of the ligaments. This is the follow-up. And from a cosmetic point of view, it, it is a very good result. As I told you, we can use different shape and different approaches. We can watch from anteriorly and put the screw from the anterolateral portal, or we can watch from the posterolateral portal and put the screw from the soft, uh, soft spot, as we, we did in some cases, or we can just use the annular ligament as a way to keep the fragment reduced. So no putting screws. I, I made a, this case I'd like to show you because I think it's a, a new frontier must be explored. In a pediatric fracture like this, we know that we have many techniques, uh, percutaneous fixation or metazo technique, but if you use the arthroscopy, in this case, we used uh, the scope for, for the waist, so the smallest one, you can see very well the cartilage as I told you before, uh, you understand the dislocation of the fragment because the distance is huge with respect to the normal anatomy. You keep the annular ligament intact. We are armoring with the chondropic to go in back, put in back the radio head in the right position. And then uh, uh, because the tendency of the radio head to go in back down, we, we put a um, key wire with a mechanism lever to keep the radio head reduced. And about the uh, coronoid, we can treat arthroscopically these two kinds of fracture. The type one is related to terrible tried and type two or anteromedial fracture related to the posteromedial. These are two different kinds of the instability. So the posteromedial instability is related to a, a mechanism that has a um, valgus compression and supination mechanism is the mechanism related to the most of the cases of the dislocation of the elbow. And we started, with, this was uh, my first case of terrible trial. The indication was uh, given by the presence of this fragment in the uh, lateral gather. So we re resect, we removed this fragment and then we did uh, um, uh, osteosuture we transosse suture of the coronoid because the fragment was small. In this way, of course, you don't achieve a very strong fixation, but it's like an anterior capsule disease of the, uh, the coronoid. Is, uh, is, uh, most of the cases are, um, are an evolution in a non-union or a fibrous union. This is the follow-up of the patient. We repaired at that time uh, the lateral complex with an anchor with a, through a small incision of two centimeters. And uh, after that case, uh, we went on, look at the distance. Now we can see very clearly that we have a lateral instability. So we uh, removed this fragment. We fixed the fragment of the radio head with a screw from the back to the front. We use this needle as landmark to understand the direction at the key wire 
you must be very careful putting the key wire uh, for the guide uh, of the screw because if you penetrate the soft tissue on the front here you have the radial nerve so it's very important to hold the key wire with a with a snap to avoid the, the penetration of the key wire in the tissue and to avoid to lose the the direction and the uh, the tunnel made by the drill for the screw now we switch the instrument we are making now uh, once again the osteosuture of the coronal because this the fragment is too small to be fixed with a screw. Uh, we like to make two parallel tunnel. Then we pass a knot. Uh, we generally use a, a reassorbable wire like a PDS. We pass the knot in the capsule behind the coronal. We don't pass through the fragment of the coronal because I am aware to break it. And then you pull the suture and after making the coronoid and the radio head we fix the ligaments with a, a small open incision put in an anchor because the in this case the surgery is a, a, a little bit long in the posterior medial cases we have a different pattern of instability we have the virus so lateral complex torn and the buttress of the coronoid the medial side of the coronoid is broken and so you have two problems to deal with the problem of the lateral ligament and the problem of the coronoid we most of the case we have only also a posterior bundle of the mcm torn but um, in many cases we, we didn't repair it so the problem about this fracture is the treatment we have two different kind of school the mayo clinic school tend to uh, try, treat this kind of uh, fracture. The Spanish school tend to not treat it, but we have um, a, a couple of points that are very important. The uh, surgical indication is done uh, by two, two tests, two different um, features. One is the CT scan. In the sagittal view, uh, if you see the incongruency, is in, it means that the elbow is unstable, so the, the fracture has to be treated. And the other important test is this one, is the virus test. So you put the arm, the shoulder 90 degree of flexion, and you stress, stress in virus. As you can see, the ulno humeral joint is opening. This is called the drop sign. It means that the elbow is unstable. On the other hand, if you make this kind of test and you see a congruency, along the wall arc of motion it means that the elbow is stable and in this case you can treat it just with a brace in a conservative way another case 35 years old anterior medial fracture another very important point is you have to study the fracture with the ct scan because if you see an involvement of the sublime tubercle you have to make the open incision because you can control a fracture that involves this area. This area is very important. We have the distal insertion of the anterior uh, bundle of the collateral ligament. So you can treat arthroscopically just the fracture that involves the tip and the anterior medial side just to the sublime tubercle. So going in the details of the technique, as I told you before, we like to make a more distal port on anterior medial. We clean the fracture, we generally are able to treat this patient in uh, five, seven days. I think it's a good window of treatment because you have no have bleeding, and you don't have fibro tissue, so it's a good compromise. You can manage very well the fracture as the aim is to achieve an anatomic reduction. You have just to push the coronoid against the trochlea. The trochlea is like a template for your coronoid and you don't have to detach the anterior capsule. So you open the fracture, you put the key wires as a guide for your cannulated screw. We prefer, if it's possible, to put more than one screw to avoid the rotation of the fragment. Then you, we work in this way, from the back to the front with the amplioscope around us. And then you keep the reduction. We, you can use retractor, chondropix, and, and you use this, uh, uh, then you make the measure of the length of the screw. You have to check if the keyword is intraticular or not. I'll show you later on the x-ray that you have to uh, use a direction from distal to proximal to avoid the joint. Then after taking the measure, you have to 
go a little bit further, hold the key wires. This is very important to avoid the anterior migration because we have the, on the front of the corner, we have the brachialis and then we have the median nerve and you can lose your key wires if you don't hold it with a, with a snap or a cocker. And then we put the screw, we check the stability of the fragment to give a, a correct post-op pot, um, protocol. And after that, in the, in the first cases, we used a, a small incision as I told you before. This was the my first cases. Uh, the patient complained about the hardware, obviously, so we changed our technique. Now we buried the screw, making two drill perforation, and we didn't have any other problems in the, in the other cases. Uh, you can even deal with more with more complex fracture like this one. You, you have three fragments, you can put three uh, screws. It's very important the diameter of the screw. In this case, we use 2.4 and uh, the technique is the same. But as you can see, now we are burying the screw in the direction is not this one. It's risky for the, um, to go in inside the joint, but if you, use this kind of direction, you are perpendicular to the rim of the fracture and you can avoid the, the joint. After these cases, we started with uh, the arthroscopic repair of the lateral ligament. Uh, we are still talking about posterior medial rotatory instability. In this case, the, the lesion of the lateral complex is, uh, uh, is minor respect to the posterior lateral rotatory. So uh, we start generally with a coronoid. Of course, we do the test under amplioscope, and now we are watching in this area, in the posterior lateral gather. So we put a PDS from the epicondyle to the soft spot in the direction of the lateral ligament. So we pass another Y from the supinatory crest to the soft spot. So we have two wires now. We join with another two wires. We pull this wire, so we have just one wire, and we use as a guide this wire to have two wires. Then we retrieve the two wires here, and we tie the knot. As you can see, the effect of the knot, we have a, uh, rec we are recovering the the space between the capital and the radial head. We're not a gap anymore. And this is a follow up. This is the original. The technique described by Dr. Mariette in uh, 2016. And uh, now we are uh, starting to repair with the anchors, the ligament. So if we see a clear detachment of the ligament from this area, we are watching from the posterior ladder portal. We can put a, a guide for the anchors. In these cases, we use the um, alt suture anchor then you have to retrieve your suture passing from distal to proximal. We use the clever hook. This is a technique described by Dr. Felix Sawa. So you to retrieve the first wire, then the second one. So we're working in this area. We're passing from here to up here. It's not very easy to reach this point. You can use the retractor to, to have more space. And then after closing the knot, you can decrease the space and recover the stability on the lateral side. This is the ligament reattached to the uh, original insertion. I, I like to go back in the front after making that to check with the probe that I recover I recovered the normal relationship between capitello and the radio head. I, I like to go back uh, anteriorly and check every time. So about the coronary, we have a, in the literature a few experience, we did 41 patients, uh, 21, now we have done more than 30. And uh, we try to treat all the uh, anatomical lesion and try to fix uh, in, in most of the cases the fracture of the corner that we screw because we like to have a stronger fixation to allow a very um, uh, active motion after a couple of days. The maps in this case is pretty good. We had just a case of complication was related 
um, to um, ulnar neuropathy post-op, uh, the patient complained about the tingling and um, uh, flexing the elbow uh, behind 90 degree. So we released, released the nerve and we treat the stiffness. It was just one month from the surgery with manipulation, we solved the problem. We never had the HO. And to finish the capital and fracture um, fixation arthroscopically, um, we have uh, just a few cases in literature. We started with this technique, but it's very important the selection of the patient. We, you have to choose the patient with a single fragment fracture with an intact lateral complex. If you have a torn ligament, as I told you for the radio head, I suggest you know, I generally prefer to do it uh, with an open approach we have, because we have to repair the ligament too. And so it's a very long surgery if you have to make it um, in arthroscopically. This kind of uh, procedure is uh, pretty difficult, I think, because we have a displaced fragment very big. So uh, it takes a, a few minutes to try to recover um, the, the normal uh, relationship anatomical, uh, anatomically speaking. But on the other end, uh, you have the advantage that you can see very well. If you had to treat this fracture uh, by an open approach, you have to detach the uh, extensor uh, muscle, of course. Uh, you have to try to avoid to detach the ligament. But if you do it arthroscopically, you can keep all the soft tissue intact. Uh, we are used to use many different kinds of instruments. There are no uh, dedicated instruments. And after working uh, from lateral, we switch the instruments so we can check from the medial side and the lateral side the reduction. As you can see, the reduction are always good. And then we fix with a percutaneous fashion the fragment with a three screw. Uh, we watch with the amplioscope to understand the entry point and uh, we check with the scope to avoid uh, the penetration of the screw. Um, this is the, ax these are the x-rays and the follow-up of the patient. She was very fine after the first uh, check, she, she didn't come back for the other checks. For the post-op management, of course, we have to uh, decide our protocol related to the kind of fixation, uh, the quality of the fixation of the ligament that we repaired. Of course, we, we try to keep the arm elevated for the first two days. After that, we start with a motion. Uh, we like to allow active motion because the secondary stabilizer are the muscle. We keep the, the brace for 30 days and we explain very carefully to the patient to avoid the barrier stress. It's very important. Uh, mainly in the posterior medial rotatory stability. We use generally the intumetacin as prophylaxis for the HO for uh, three weeks. And uh, so to uh, finish in the presentation, I will stress uh, once again the importance to understand the pattern of instability. So when we bring this kind of patient of in the OR, we just, uh, every time we start with an amplioscopic control to check in ligament, so you can decide if you feel comfortable to approach it arthroscopically or not, you have to decide the, the position of the patient. So uh, it, it's very important to have the clear in mind which kind of structure you have to refer. Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias. Muy, muy buena presentación. Eh, con respecto, a ver, tenemos algunas preguntas. Uh, bueno, I, 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 see. See, I see the, the, the I use uh, ah. very often the indometacin, even in fracture, and uh, more or less every time after the arthroscopy, uh, mm -hmm. in a, with a, for three times a day for 20 days. And uh, of course, he has a function uh, as an analgesic function too. So I currently use the, the indometacin. Bueno, entonces indometacina por tres días, tres veces por día. Muy bien. Eh, son muy interesantes esos casos de, de fracturas más complejas, ¿no? De, de cúpula de radio proximal. ¿Cómo, cómo maneja el, el control radioscópico y el setup de quirófano? Hacen hace la artroscopía con el equipo ya colocado 
o cómo lo, lo va a... Generally, start the arthroscopy uh, on itself. And then if we have to use the amplioscope, as we do normally, we put the arch in this way. This way, così. Sí, and sí. they have to turn the amplioscope and put it in this way. In this way, you can work with the instrument, lateral and medially, and the instrument, the other people of the equip can help you. Uh, other surgeon prefer to have the C arm around you from the back to the front, but in this way, you, you can move. Yes. Anybody can help you. So I prefer to put it in this way. I think it is nice. We, unfortunately, we have a big one, it is not very useful. Somebody else have a smaller one, and so it probably is better, but um, uh, I prefer to put in in this way. Okay. Ahí está viendo, hay otra pregunta, no sé si, si le, le gustan los tornillos biabsorbibles en OCD cases. Uh, uh, OCD is a huge chapter. Sí, es muy grande, un tema, digamos, hay casos uh, puntuales, um, ¿no? Uh, we we do. Uh, it depends of the site of uh, depends of the size of the fragment. It depends <coughs> on the site of the lesion. So uh, we study the OCD with MRI, but also with CT scan. CT scan is is more important than MRI. They give you an idea of the wall of the OCD. So if we have a good wall, or if um, you are not able to refix the fragment, so the CT scan is very important. Uh, normally, we use uh, more than screws, uh, um, kind of technique is like called like a, an umbrella. So you can do it uh, both on by open or arthroscopic approach. You have to um, uh, make a perforation in the center of the fragment. And you retrieve with your PDS wire and the PDS wire can uh, hold the fragment. Or you can make a cross constructor of the PDS. So instead to use the, the screws inside the fragment, you can use the PDS that uh, surround your fragment and keeping in contact with the wall or the, the hole left from the OCD fragment. So we don't use normally screws, we use the PDS if we yes. want to fix the fragment, yeah. Okay. Respecto a, lo, a esos casos de, de lesiones ligamentarias, ¿Tenés algún, algún tiempo para, para pensar en la reparación o, o pensar en la reconstrucción? No sé en qué momento te llegan los pacientes para el tratamiento quirúrgico. ¿Algún tipo o, 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 o tiempo para pensar en, en, en suplementarlo con injerto de tendón? ¿En acute o chronic cases? Chronic, digamos. ¿O ¿Cuál es el tiempo justamente para considerar acute o chronic cases? To, to consider uh, one or another. I, I generally um, prefer, uh, if it is a major chronic instability, I use a graft. I go by open. I okay. never, I don't uh, recall to never convert from arthroscopy to open to reconstruct the lateral side. If I see is a minor instability, uh, most of the cases I use the, the barrier technique. With so a, a kind of shortening of the ligament with a PDS. But if I know it's a huge instability, I prefer to make a cocker incision, a graft. So um, in most of the cases, I decide before the surgery. And uh, uh, in acute cases, uh, the limits is uh, most of the case is around 20 days. 20 days, okay. if you can use the the patient, the, the patient tissue on another bed, but uh, it's very difficult to to tell you exactly the time, the right time. But uh, in acute cases, we we refer. I never use the, the graft in acute cases, of course. Resumiendo, la doctora dice que que toma 20 días aproximadamente para definir si es agudo o crónico y para definir una una técnica abierta con reconstrucción o ir a la reparación que que mostró en forma aguda. Edgardo, no sé si tiene alguna pregunta. El doctor Osvandré está haciendo una pregunta ahí, Juan Martín. Sí, yo quería bueno. preguntar eh, si siempre utiliza el gesto de protección de, de, para que no se corra el Kirchner cuando introduce el tornillo, con la pinza, ¿no? Con eh, la, la pro, eh, protección eh, con un... No, capito. Uh, la protección de, de agarrar el Kirchner para que no se deslice. Siempre, siempre, siempre. 
es mucho importante. Um, I, I think in a, uh, because I, I did a, a, um, I'm making a lot of cases every time I I have the tendency not to use it, but every time do, stop do it because if you lose the whole is a tragedy. You have to, because in the back of the of the ulna, if you have to fix the coronoid, we make a small incision like this is a half centimeter. So if you lose the, the, the elbow can be as well because the trauma, because the atrocity, if you lose the whole, you can waste a couple, five minutes to refine the hole. So it's very important to hold it, I think. Okay, thank you. Aquí preguntan si, si ha usado, hay algunos papers recientes de uso de celecoxib en lugar de indometacin, si tiene alguna opinión sobre eso. Uh, um, uh, we keep going on with the endometacin. I, I think it's, a, it's just a, our custom. I don't sí, think, claro. uh, but I'm sure that the, the reason of the HO is, uh, is a lot more complex. I think is related to many other factors the, if we are talking about the HO, uh, particularly uh, to the um, uh, aggressiveness, um, aggressivity of the surgeon to aggressivity of the physiotherapy, uh, to the um, uh, presence or not uh, of dislocation, uh, to the length of the, from the trauma of the, the time that you uh, go in, with the patient you are, the, the, the many days that are. Uh, okay. So there are many um, other factors for the HO. I think it's not uh, just a, a chemical problem. Y luego, eh, si, si, en, si mantiene el, el codo en extensión o elevado en el postoperatorio y por cuánto tiempo, en estos casos we de fracturas. Sí, yeah, we normally put the elbow elevated, as I, um, as I told in a slide, for two days. This is the, the average. Uh, I'm, most of the cases are doing this way, even for trauma and uh, elective surgery. Y en esos casos de rigidez eh, mencionó que usa eh, bloqueo, ¿no? ¿Qué tipo de bloqueo? Eh, ¿Pectoral o...? Our anesthesiologist use the interscalenic of a uh, supraclaver block. Infraclaver, sorry. Infraclaver block is the favorite one because uh, is, uh, uh, you have less risk of lose the, the catheterine. So in uh, the more complex, in the most complex surgeries, we prefer to uh, make the block. Uh, now I uh, they put a little bit of an injection of local anesthetic to have an immediate um, uh, analgesic effect on the arm after the end of the surgery. So we don't check the status or neurological status, but at the beginning, I suggest you to put the catheter in, don't inject anything then uh, uh, make a general anesthesia and after that check the neurological status and then inject the, the anest local anesthetic. It's better for your uh, para, para mind control. to know if you are, if you are damaged in the nervous knot. But after a, a few cases you can start to inject this something. It's, a, it's the best okay. way to approach a patient. The doctor says that he prefers to the catheter to controlar el control, eh, hacer el control neurológico y luego hacer el anestésico para, para hacer un buen control. Y después, ¿cuántas veces por día hacen la, digamos, el paciente está anestesiado? ¿Lo van chequeando varias veces por día para movilizarlo? ¿Cómo manejan ese, ese, ese uh, control? We keep the, the catheter for a couple of days, for two days. So we... In, a, in elective surgery, we use like a, this a Statue of Liberty position and we leave the patient after two days, we leave the patient free. We use CPM machine with the catheter in, okay. but uh, um, more or less we keep the catheter in two days because the okay. patient after two days are discharged, they, are, they have the endometacin, they, generally they don't complain a, a lot about the pain. In post-traumatic patient, after two days, we start with a physiotherapy we um, in the same we leave the catheter for two days and then we use the brace we and uh, we go on with the endos endometacin obviously so generally two days of catheter okay dos días de catheter entonces bueno eh, Juan, no sé, Rodrigo una una eh, pregunta Dani. 
Eh, quedó una pregunta interesante de Luis Pedro Carranza con respecto a las... A ver, por un lado diferenciamos lo que es la osificación heterotópica y las calcificaciones, como dos entidades totalmente distintas. Pero yo considero que él se refiere a las osificaciones heterotópicas, tanto Alessandra como Juan Pablo, frente a una osificación heterotópica instalada, eh, que realmente es una pesadilla, ¿cuál es su, su proceder? Bueno, um, we can treat atroscopically the osification, but there are some very important points. We have to study the relation between the HO and the skin, the HO <laughs> and the nerves. And we have to be sure that we have a very safe cle cleavage uh, plane if you want to resect the HO arthroscopically. <laughs> and another point, very important point, is the size of the HO. Um, if we have a huge uh, HO on the posterior medial side of the elbow, it's better to approach it uh, with an open approach. But if we have a small HO uh, on the back, on the front, uh, air, uh, if we have a cleavage plane for the nerve, we can uh, approach it arthroscopically. So it's mandatory to make the CT scan. In the, um, in the soft tissue uh, windows uh, in the axial plane, we have to follow the nerves, the medial nerve, ornal nerve, and the radial nerve mainly, uh, to understand the relation between them. <laughs> Uh, but I, where you are in doubt is better to approach it open. So sometimes I approach a huge lateral HO uh, uh, opening with a cocker, extensive cocker, looking for the nerves, retracting the nerves and then going inside the joint. So in this, in this way you are safe. Uh, you don't, and don't have to risk any time. Claro, en, en las osificaciones grandes o las que están alrededor de los nervios, Siempre lo más seguro, lo más fácil es buscar nervio sano, nervio sano, de un lado y del otro, y después trabajar sobre la osificación, y eso te lo permite hacerlo abierto y no, no artroscópico, dependiendo de la localización. Una consulta, Alessandra, doctora. El tema de la fractura, lo, ah, ¿la artroscopía la hace de inmediato o aguarda un periodo para de las partes blandas desinflamen? Uh, um, in our organization, it's very difficult to bring in your in one, two days. So uh, we generally, if we have a dislocation, of course, we, we reduce the dislocation. We put the patient in a, a sling or a brace for a, a splint, more than most of the case. And uh, uh, we ask for a CT scan. Um, we generally bring the patient after five, six days after the trauma. In this way, uh, you don't have the bleeding of the fracture, and uh, it's a good window of time to go do the surgery. In some cases, I have uh, the, the I, I operated the patient after one two weeks. Uh, it becomes a little bit different because the ligament starting to repair spontaneously. Uh, you have a fibro tissue in the fracture, so if you can, five days is a good moment. Perfecto, muchísimas gracias. Eh, no hay ninguna consulta más, no hay ninguna pregunta. Eh, bueno, eh, agradecerles a todos a nombre de la Sociedad gracias. Boliviana de Ortopedia y Traumatología. Muchísimas gracias, doctor Juan Pablo Simone, la, de, la doctora Alessandra Colosa y a la Asociación Argentina de Hombro y Codo por permitirnos realizar este excelente webinar. Fue muy provechoso para todos nosotros. Desearles que estén muy bien, que se cuide mucho y salgamos pronto de esta pandemia. Muchísimas gracias por todo. Gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias. Gracias, gracias Alessandra, gracias a todos. Chao, Alessandra. Chao, cuídense. Un abrazo. Chao. Hasta luego.